Ever feel like changing your life for the better and you don't know where to start? Follow me. Welcome to M25 Personal Development. I'm your host, Daniel B. And let's go on an adventure together. Psycho Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. Forward by Melvin Powers. A new technique for using your subconscious power. What could that be? Well, I read this book about a year ago and it has changed my life. Absolutely. This was um, the first. Um, self-help psychology book that I have read and it is amazing. So what I want to do for the next several videos is I want to go through this book and explain kind of the highlights of each chapter and what it can kind of do for your life. And I highly encourage you to go to eBay it would be the cheapest way to get this and that's what I did. I paid like three or four dollars for this. Um, and I just looked and you can still get it for under $5 as a used copy, as mine was. And it is the best $5 or less that you will ever spend, hands down. So don't take my word for it. Go on eBay, check it out. Go to the library, you could probably get it too. So either way, but I would, I'd buy it if I were you. I highlight stuff in here and underline stuff. And this is something you want to read a few, a few times and maybe once a year. But super excited about it. So let's begin. Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz, forward by Melvin Powers. A new way to get more living out of life, which sounds good to me. This is the 1965 edition. Just so you are aware, there are several different types of this book, different editions throughout the years. So the cover looks like this one. I would recommend this one. There are slight variations in the other ones. Um, I looked into them when I first bought this and people said, um, like in Amazon reviews and, and things like that, to get this copy specifically, the 1965 one. So, but I'm sure any one of them will be better than not buying it at all. So, just want to throw that out there for you guys. After a short trial, I became convinced that the programming of suggestion into the subconscious mind, utilizing the feedback mechanisms of cybernetics, was the final step that had been needed to make possible the complete reconstruction of personality as well as changing specific negative habit, habit, habit patterns. So true. Programming material into the brain is only effective it is in impressed on the memory cells of the subconscious mind rather than superficially remembering by the conscious mind or remembered by the conscious mind. It is now recognized that the phenomena of hypnosis can be produced in the normal walking state by utilizing the so-called conditioned reflex first explained by Pavlov. And if you don't know who Pavlov is, it's the experiment. So in Pavlov, every time he would ring the bell, the dog would salivate because his brain told him that food was coming on the way, that he was about to be fed. Um, so he kept on doing this conditioning of ringing the bell, giving the dog food, and, that, and then he found out that he could ring the bell and the dog would automatically think food's coming and salivate immediately on on demand basically so if you don't know know about that study you should look into that as well all right dr Moltz program makes us makes use of the conditioned reflex or response hypnosis and or self-hypnosis is now an elective procedure very interesting the secret of using this book to change your life. Discovery of the self-image represents a breakthrough in psychology and in the field of creative personality. It is somewhat unorthodox for a plastic surgeon to write a book on psychology. My answer is any good plastic surgeon is and must be a psychologist. 
when you change a man's face, you almost always change his future, change his physical image, and nearly always you change the man, his personality, his behavior, and sometimes even his basic talents and abilities. Beauty is more than skin deep. A plastic surgeon does not simply alter a man's face. He alters the man inner self. The incisions he makes are more than just skin deep. I feel that if changing a man's face is going to change the inner man as well, I have a responsibility to acquire specialized knowledge in the field also. Failures that lead to success. Some patients showed no change in personality after surgery. In most cases, a person who had a ugly face or some freakish feature corrected by surgery experiences an almost immediate, within 21 days usually, rise in self-esteem and self-confidence. But in some cases, the patient continued to feel inadequate and experience feeling of inferiority. In short, these failures continue to feel and act and behave just as they still had the unaltered face. Very interesting. The face of personality. I found more and more phenomena which confirm the fact that the self-image the individual's mental and spiritual concept or picture of himself was the real key to person personality and behavior. More about this going forward. The self-image is the key to human personality and human behavior. Change the self-image and you change the personality and behavior. The self-image sets the boundaries of individual accomplishment. It defines what you can and cannot do. Expand the self-image and you expand the area of possibility. The development of an adequate, realistic self-image will seem to imbue the individual with new capabilities, new talents, and literally turn failure into success. Positive thinking does indeed work when it is cons consistent with the individual self-image. It literally cannot work when it is inconsistent with the self-image until the image itself has been changed. There is an abundance of scientific evidence which shows that the human brain and nervous system operate pur purposefully in accordance with the known principles of cybernetics to accomplish goals of the individual. The brain and the nervous system constitute a marvelous and complex goal-striving mechanism, a sort of built-in automatic guidance system which works for you as a success mechanism or against you as a failure mechanism, depending on how you, the operator, operate it and the goals you set for it. The science of cybernetics does not tell us that a man is a machine, but that a man has and uses a machine. Moreover, they tell us that the machine functions, they tell us how the machine functions and how it can be used. Experiencing is the secret. Experience. The self-image is changed for better or for worse, not by intellect alone, nor by intellectual knowledge alone, but by experiencing. It is not the child who is taught about love, but the child who has experienced love that grows into a healthy, happy, and well-adjusted adult. Our present state of self-confidence and pose and poise is the result of what we have experienced rather than what we have learned intellectually. Science discovers synthetic experience. Allow us to synthesize experience, to literally create experience and control it in the laboratory of our minds. 
Experimental and clinical psychologists have proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the human nervous system cannot tell the difference between an actual experience and an experience imagined vividly and in detail. That's very interesting to think about. Perhaps most, perhaps most important of all, we will learn how chronically unhappy people have learned to enjoy life by experiencing happiness, which is very important. Last time I checked, right? That's why we're here. The secret of using this book to change your life. You can acquire information from reading a book, but to experience, you must creatively respond to the information. Acquiring information itself is passive. Experiencing is active. When you experience, something happens inside your nervous system and your midbrain. New engrams and neural patterns are recorded in the gray matter of your brain. What is success? Success has nothing to do with prestige symbols, but with creative accomplishment. Rightly speaking, no man should attempt to be a success, but every man can and should attempt to be successful. Trying to be a success in terms of acquiring prestige symbols and wearing certain badges leads to uh, neuroticism and frustration and unhappiness. Striving to be successful brings not only material success, but satisfaction, fulfillment, and happiness. All right, that was the, um, the preface. We're gonna move on to chapter one. The self-image, your key to a better life. Understanding the psychology of the self can mean the difference between success and failure, love and hate, bitterness and happiness. The discovery of the real self can rescue a crumbly marriage recreate a faltering career, transform victims of personally failures. On another plane, discovering your real self means the difference between freedom and the compulsions of conformity. Interesting. The most important psychological discovery of this century is the discovery of the self-image, whether we realize it or not. Each of us carries about with us a mental blueprint or picture of ourselves. The self-image is our own conception of the sort of person I am. It has been built up from our own beliefs about ourselves. But most of these beliefs about ourselves have unconsciously been formed from our past experiences, our successes and failures, our humiliations, our triumphs, and, and the way that other people have reacted to us especially in early childhood. From all of these, we mentally construct a self or a picture of self. Once an idea or a belief about ourselves goes into the picture, it becomes true as far as we are personally concerned. We do not question it. We just proceed to act upon it as if it were true, creating your own reality. The self-image becomes a golden key to living a better life because of two important discoveries. Number one, all your actions, feelings, behavior, even your abilities are always consistent with the self-image. In short, you will act like the sort of person you conceive yourself to be. Not only this, but you literally cannot act otherwise. In spite of all your conscious efforts or willpower, the man who convinces himself he is a failure type person will find some way to fail in spite of all his good intentions or his willpower. Even if the opportunity is literally dumped in his lap, the person who conceives himself to be a victim of injustice, one who, who was meant to suffer, will find circumstances to verify his opinions. Thus, creating his reality. The self-image is a premise, a base, 
or a foundation upon which your entire personality, your behavior, or even your circumstances are built. Because of this, our experiences seem to verify and therefore strengthen our, our self-images and vicious or beneficial cycle, as the case may be, is set up. For example, a schoolboy who sees himself as an F-type student or one who is not gifted in mathematics will find that his report card bears him out. He then will have his proof of who he is. A young girl who has an image of herself as the sort of person that nobody likes will find indeed that she, she is avoided at the school dance. She literally invites rejection to herself. Her woebegone expression, her hangdog manner, her over-anxious anxiousness to please, or perhaps her unconscious hostility towards those she anticipates will affront her, all act to, to drive those away that she would normally attract. But with that mindset, she can't do it. And number two, the self-image can be changed. Numerous cases, case studies has shown this. You're never too old or too young to change your self-image. One of the reasons it seems so difficult for a person to change his habits, his personality, or the way of his life has been that theretofore nearly all efforts at change have been directed to the circumstances of the self, so to speak, rather than the center. Numerous patients have said to me something like the following. If you were talking about positive thinking, I've tried that before, and it just doesn't work for me. However, a little, little questioning brings out that the individuals have employed positive thinking or attempted to employ it, either upon particular external circumstances or upon some particular habit or character deficit. I will get that job. I will be more calm and relaxed in the future. This business venture will t turn out right for me next time. But they never had thought to change their thinking of the self, which has to accomplish these. But they never thought to change their thinking of the self, which was to accomplish these things. Because the self's in control. Positive thinking cannot be used efficiently effectively as a patch or a crutch to the same old self-image. In fact, it is literally impossible to really think positively about a particular situation as long as you hold a negative concept of yourself. And numerous experiments have shown that once the concept of self has changed, other things consistent with the new concept of self are accomplished easily and without strain. A symbol, sorry, a sim, sim, a system of ideas, all which must seem to be consistent with each other. Ideas which are inconsistent with the system are rejected, not believed, and not acted upon. Ideas which seem to be consistent with the system are accepted. At the very center of, of the system of ideas, the keystone, the base upon which all else is built is the individual's ego ideal, his self-image or his conception of himself. Anything that threatens your way of thinking, you will immediately put up a brick wall and just write it off as crazy, oh I tried that, oh I know what you're talking about but it didn't work for me. You just think you know exactly what someone's talking about and you don't, have, you have no clue because it uh, interferes with your self-image and with the reality that you have constructed. Uh, it's very interesting and I see it all the time now. So definitely get this book guys. Get it. Get it. <laughs> all right. Where are we at? All right. They identified with their mistakes and failures. Instead of saying, I failed the test, they conclude, I am a failure. Instead of saying, I flunk that subject, they say, I'm a dropout or I'm a flunk out. Do you see the difference between those? How a plastic surgeon became interested in self-image psychology. 
When I first began the practice of plastic surgery many years ago, I was amazed by the dramatic and sudden change in character and personality which often resulted when a facial defect was corrected. Changing the physical image in many instances appeared to create an entirely new person. In case after case, the scalpel that I held in my hand became a magic, magic wand that not only transformed the patient's appearance, but transformed his whole life. The shy and retiring became bold and courageous. A moronic, stupid boy changed into an alert, bright youngster who went on to become an executive with a awesome, uh, or not awesome, a prominent firm, a great firm. All right. A salesman who lost his touch and his faith in himself became a model of self-confidence. And perhaps the most startling of all of this was the habitual hardened criminal who changed almost overnight from a very out of touch human who's never showed any desire to change into a model prisoner who won a parole and went to assume a responsible role in society after being released. But what about the exceptions to the people who didn't change? The Duchess, who all her life have been terribly shy and self-conscious of a uh, tremendous hump on, in her, on her nose, although surgery gave her a classic nose and a face that was truly beautiful, she still continued to act the part of the ugly duckling. The unwanted sister, who could never bring herself to look at another human being in the eye. If the scalpel itself was magic, why did it not work on the Duchess? Or what about all the others who acquired new faces but went right along wearing the same old personalities? Or how, or how explain the reaction to those who insist that the surgery had made no difference whatsoever in their appearance? Every plastic surgeon has had this experience and has probably been as baffled as I was with it. No matter how drastic the change in appearance may be, there are certain patients who will insist that, I look the same as just before, you didn't even do anything. Like physically, like didn't touch the blade to my face kind of thing. Friends, family may seem, could hardly even recognize her after. And she still could not see any change at all. And there, there's a lot of people like that. It's, it's very interesting. I just look the same as before. You didn't do anything. Friends, even family, may scarcely recognize them may become enthusiastic over their newly acquired beauty, yet the patient herself insists that she can only slight, can see slight or no improvement, or in fact, deny that any change at all has even been performed. Comparisons of before and after photos does little to no good, except to arise the possibility of hostility from the patient. Scars that bring pride instead of shame. When I was a young medical student in Germany, I saw another student probably wearing his saber scar, such as an American might wear the Medal of Honor. The acquisition of a horrible scar on the cheek had the same psychological effect as the eradication of the scar from the cheek of a, of a salesman patient that didn't think he could sell anything, and then he turned out to be the number one salesman after he rediscovered his new self-image. Pretty amazing stuff. I began to see that a knife itself had no magical powers. It could be used on one person to inflict a scar and on another to erase uh, a scar with the same psychological results. The mystery of imaginary ugliness. To a person handicapped by a genuine uh, congenital defect or suffering an actual fa facial disfigurement as a result of an accident, plastic surgery can indeed seemingly perform magic. From such cases, it would be easy to theorize that the cure-all for neuroses, unhappiness, failure, fear, anxiety, and lack of self-confidence would be wholesale plastic surgery to remove all bodily defects. 
However, according to this theory, persons with normal or acceptable faces should be singularly free from all psychological handicaps. They should be cheerful, happy, self-confident, free from anxiety and worry. We all know too well that this is not true. There are young girls who are convinced that they are ugly, marrying because their mouth, nose, or bust measurements does not, does not exactly match that of the current reigning movie queen. And this was written in 1965, and it's the exact same thing today still, right? And that in social media, Instagram, just anything that has kind of a superficial exterior to it can create these problems for people. That's the, the downside of, of technology, kind of. So, going forward here. Um, there are men who believe that their ears are too big or their nose is too long. No ethical plastic surgeon would even considering operating upon these people, but unfortunately the quacks or so-called beauty doctors whom no medical association will admit to membership have no such qualms. Such imaginary ugliness is not at all uncommon. A recent survey of college students showed that 90% were dissatisfied in some way with their appearance. If the words normal or average mean anything at all, it is obviously that 90% of our population cannot be abnormal or different or defective in appearance. Yet similarly, surveys have shown that approximately the same percentage of our general population find some reason to be ashamed of their body image. These people react just as if they suffered an actual disfigurement. They feel the same shame. They de develop the same fears and anxieties. Their capacity to really live fully is blocked and choked by the same sort of psychological roadblocks. Their scars through mental and emotional rather than physical are just, just as debilitating. debilitating. The self-image, the real secret. Discovery of the self-image explains all the apparent discrepancies we have been discussing. It is the common denominator, the determining factor in all of our case histories, the failures as well as the successes. The secret is this, to really live. That is, to find life reasonably satisfying, you must have an adequate and realistic self-image that you can live with. You must find yourself so you must find yourself acceptable to you to you you must have a wholesome self-esteem you must have a self that you can trust and believe in you must have a self that you are not ashamed to be and one that you can feel free to express creatively rather than just to hide or cover up you must have a set that corresponds to reality so that you can function effectively in the real world. You must know yourself, both your strengths and your weaknesses, and be honest with yourself concerning both. Your self-image must be a reasonable approximation of you being neither more than you are nor less than you are. When this self-image is intact and secure, you feel good. When it is threatened, you feel anxious and insecure. When it is adequate and one that you can be with wholesomely proud of, you feel self-confident. You feel free to be yourself and to express yourself. You function at your optimum. When it is an object of shame, you attempt to hide it rather than express it. Creative expression is blocked. You become hostile and hard to get along with. If a scar on the face enhances the self-image, as in the case of the uh, German duelist, Self-esteem and self-confidence are increased. If the scar on the face distracts from the self-image, as in the case of the salesman, loss of self-esteem and self-confidence results. When a facial disfigurement is corrected by a plastic surgery, dra dramatic psychological changes result only if there is a corresponding correlation co correction of the mutilated self-image. Sometimes the image of a disfigured self persists even after successful surgery. Much of the same as the phantom limb, 
may continue to feel pain years after the physical arm or leg has been amputated. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about a phantom limb before. If not, Google it. Today, I am more convinced than ever that what each of us really wants deep down is more life. Happiness, success, peace of mind, or whatever your own concept of supreme good may be, is experience in the same essence as more life. When we experience expansive emotions of happiness, self-confidence, and success, we enjoy, enjoy more life. And to the degree that we inhibit our abilities, frustrate our God-given talents, and allow ourselves to suffer anxiety, fear, self-condemnation, and self-hate, we literally choke off the life force available to us and turn our back upon which our Creator has made. To the degree that we deny the gift of life, we embrace death. Your program for better living. Since psychologists deal with so, deal with so many so-called abnormal people, the literature is almost exclusively taken up with man's various abnormalities, his tendencies towards self-destruction. Many people, I am afraid, have read so much of this type of thing that they have come to regard such things as hatred. The destructive instinct guilt, the self-condemnation, and all of their negative as normal human behavior. The average person feels awkward, but the average person feels awfully weak and impotent, impotent when he thinks of the prospect of pitting his puny will against these negative forces in human nature. In order to gain health and happiness. If this were true, picture of human nature and the human condition self-improvement would need be a rather futile thing. There is within each of us a life instinct which is forever working towards health, happiness, and all that makes for a more, more life for the individual. This life instinct works for you. And it also works through what I call the creative mechanism or when used correctly, the success mechanism built into each human being. New scientific insights into unconscious mind. This creative mechanism within you is impersonal. It will work automatically and impersonally to achieve goals like success and happiness or unhappiness and failure, depending upon the goals which you set for yourself. Very true. Present it with success goals and it functions as a success mechanism. Present it with negative goals and it operates just as impersonally and just as faithfully as a failure mechanism. Like any other servo mechanism, it must have a clear-cut goal, objective, or problem to work upon. The goal that our own creative mechanism seeks to achieve are mental images or mental pictures which we create by the use of our imagination. The key to the key goal image, the key goal image is our self-image. Our self-image prescribes the limits for the accomplishment of any particular goals. It prescribes the area of possibility. Like any other servo mechanism, our creative mechanism works upon information and data which we feed into it our thoughts, beliefs, and interpretations. Through our attitudes and interpretations of situations, we describe the problem to be worked upon. If we feed the information and data into our creative mechanism to the effect that we ourselves are unworthy, inferior, undeserving, incapable, a negative self-image, uh, the data is processed and acted upon us, uh, acted upon as any other data in a given us an answer in the form of an objective experience. Like any other servo mechanism, our creative mechanism makes use of stored information or memory in solving current problems and responding to current situations. Your program for getting more living out of life consists in, first of all, learning something about the creative mechanism or automatic guidance system within you and how to use it as a success mechanism rather than as a failure mechanism. The method itself consists in learning, practicing, and experiencing, experiencing new habits of thinking, 
imagining, remembering, and acting in order to, one, develop an adequate and realistic self-image, and two, use your creative mechanism to bring success and happiness in achieving particular goals. If you can remember, worry, or tie your shoe, you can succeed. As you see, as you will see later, the method to be used consists of creative mental picturing, creative experiencing through your imagination, and the forming of new automatic reaction patterns by acting out and acting as if. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Sound familiar? Visualizing creative mental picture, creative mental picturing is no more difficult than what you do when you remember some scene out of the past or worry about the future. Acting out of, acting out a new action patterns is no more difficult than deciding, than following through on tying your shoes in a new and different manner each morning, instead of continuing to tie them in your old habitual way, without thought or decision. End chapter one. <sighs> All right, if you like that, stay tuned for my next video. This is M25 Personal Development, and I'm your host, Daniel B. Uh, living the dream, if you know what I mean. And thank you for watching.